Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. In the early 2000s, North Korea became increasingly isolated on the international stage, acquiring nuclear weapons technology, while diplomatic channels, such as the Six-Party Talks, came to a halt. During the two presidential terms of George W. Bush, Washington's policy towards Pyongyang focused on confrontation rather than engagement, famously placing North Korea on the so-called axis of evil, and was repeatedly criticized by experts and policymakers alike. Yet the question remains whether the United States deserved the blame and whether this criticism might paint a one-sided image. To learn more about the American views and policy towards North Korea during the Bush years, we had the honor of talking to Victor Cha, who was in the White House at the time. He worked as Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council between 2004 and 2007 and also served as Deputy Head of Delegation for the United States at the Six Party Talks in Beijing. For this episode, we talked about his time in the Bush administration and his views on the current situation surrounding North Korea. Today, Professor Victor Cha is Director of Asian Studies at Georgetown University. He has published articles in numerous academic journals including International Security and Foreign Affairs, and is a regular contributor to various media such as CNN and The New York Times. His most recent book, The Impossible State, North Korea, Past and Future, was selected by Foreign Affairs as the best book of 2012 on the Asia-Pacific. Professor Cha holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University and master's from Columbia University and the University of Oxford. Dr. Victor Cha, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Glad to be here. Why did you decide to focus your studies and research on North Korea? Actually, it wasn't my initial area of focus. My initial area of focus was actually economics. That's what I studied as an undergrad. And eventually it evolved to political science. And the main focus was really more East Asian security. But after I got tenure, I wrote my first op-ed for the New York Times on the situation in North Korea. And from then, one thing led to another, became an interest of mine in terms of research. It was really work I didn't do prior to tenure because it, North Korea work is much more policy related. And, um, you know, doing policy related work is not good for tenure. But after I did, then I started uh, doing a little bit more on North Korea. And then that eventually led to work in the government uh, on North Korea and then some of my books after I left, uh, I left government. So... It was really more accidental than anything else. It was never anything that was planned. So from 2004 to 2007, you served in the White House of George W. Bush on the National Security Council and as the president's advisor on Asian affairs. Could you maybe quickly summarize what you were actually doing there for the audience and well, me? (coughs) So the NSC is a very small organization relative to the rest of the U.S. government. It's about 200 or so people. The State Department, for example, might have an office of 20 people working on Korea. The Japan office may have 30 people working on Japan. And at the NSC, I was responsible for both, and there was only one of me. So it's a very flat organization. Um, And essentially, the job is to basically be the inbox for the White House on any piece of paper or anything related to your area of responsibility, in my case, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Island nations, as well as the six-party talks. You know, any anything that the president reads or writes or says on these issues, anything the National Security Advisor reads, writes, or says on these issues um, comes across our desk uh, at the NSC. So it's a very intense job, very, very long hours. There's a phrase in English, drinking from a fire hose, and it really is like that uh, every day. But at the same time, the NSC was created actually by the Eisenhower administration to be the personal staff to the president and the White House for the purpose of giving the president an independent viewpoint from state or defense or others, uh, as well as acting as a body that would help to coordinate the interagency process. So um, it's a lot. it was a lot of responsibility, but at the same time, Hard work, but also a lot of fun. How did your outlook on North Korea change through this experience? That's a hard question to answer because really before the experience, I didn't have very much of an impression or position on North Korea, particularly when it came to negotiations. 
But I think I found in the course of doing negotiations with them that, for one, contrary to what the press and media and pundits say, I think that the United States, whether you're talking about the current administration or past administrations, truly has been committed to trying to find a negotiated solution to the North Korea problem. I think they've been truly committed for the past 25 years, whether you're talking about Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Clinton, George W. Bush, or even President Obama. I think there's really been a commitment there to try to find a negotiated solution. And I think the second thing that I found was that Across all those administrations, while there is a sense in the public that there are vast differences, uh, that Clinton was in very much in favor of engagement, that Bush was against it, that Obama does strategic patience, if you actually look very carefully at all the policies and the efforts, there's a great deal of consistency. And I think that's one of the things I learned from my government experience that I probably wouldn't have appreciated as much if I had been just outside of government. So you mentioned the difference between pre-tenure work and post in your work. How valuable was your academic experience in the environment you described? How much did you feel your input was actually valued? Well, I think that, you know, the U.S. government's a big, big bureaucracy. But I think if there's any place where you can have an impact, it is in a small organization at the top like the NSC. I'm not going to pretend to say what my impact was on policy. You know, I would like to think that I was helpful that I gave the president and the national security advisor good advice that was not simply based on sort of the interagency process and policies, but also based on my own experiences and research as a scholar, uh, which I would hope gave some perspective on the issues that I advised on. In general, I think academics are well positioned to work in policy in the sense that they do have a great deal of knowledge background knowledge and context on whatever issue that they may be working on. And academics are very good at thinking critically. The things academics are not so good at is the next step in policy, which is you can't just criticize a problem. You have to offer a solution and you have to offer not just the long-term solution, but what practically is the next immediate step in terms of getting towards that solution. Many academics have trouble making that transition. Academics are great at criticizing. They can tell you everything that's wrong with an issue and why it's so interesting and why it's so insoluble. But actually advocating or recommending what the next practical step is, is a much harder thing to do, which um, government bureaucrats, policymakers are very good at doing. Uh, and I think good academics in policy are the ones who both have the context, but also have the pragmatic skills to think about what's the next logical step in trying to solve a problem. Over the course of the Bush presidency, relations with North Korea remained overall icy and the country was able to push forward its nuclear program. The former president, Kim Dae-jung, spoke of eight lost years. Looking back, would you agree with that assessment? I don't think I would agree with that 100%. I mean, clearly, if you look at the North Korean uh, situation right now, They're amassing more weapons. According to Chinese experts, they could have as many as 20 by the end of this year based on their uranium program. So it looks like their program is growing. But I would like to think that um, it was during the period, the two years of the Bush administration. And I'm saying this not just because I work for President Bush, but because, you know, having studied the nuclear negotiations for the past 25 years, I think it's an objective expert assessment. I mean, it was during that period that we had the last agreement. Uh, we haven't had an agreement since then. It was during that period in 2005 to 2007 that Chris Hill, in the lead as negotiator, not just froze North Korea's nuclear programs, but actually started to dismantle them in the form of members of the six-party delegations, including Japan, South Korea, Russia, and others were actually sending people to Yongbyon to inspect the facilities. Um, and of course, then there was also the collapse of the cooling tower, the handing over of operating records from the Yongbyon nuclear plant, as well as samples of aluminum tubes that the North Koreans purchased from other countries that look consistent with a uranium-based nuclear program. So I think there were real efforts and progress made at freezing the program and degrading it. The metric for U.S. policy should certainly be the extent to which the program has been stopped. But we don't have full control over that. In the end, the North Koreans have ultimate say. And in each case, whether it was the agreed framework in 1994 or the 2005 joint statement, 
the North Koreans have chosen in both cases to basically step away from those agreements and build their program. So I don't think it was eight years of lost time. Uh, like I said, I believe that there was progress made in terms of freezing and dismantling some aspects of their program. But um, whether it was the 94 agreement or the 2005 agreement, there were suspicions, but nobody knew for certain whether North Korea was actually developing a second secret nuclear program aside from the program that was stopped by the two agreements. And as we see today, very clearly they have, and that was always their intention. So I don't think, you know, eight years was lost. I think there was a lot of negotiation that took place. There was a new framework that was created. The current administration today, their primary precondition for negotiating with North Korea is to bring the North Koreans back to a reaffirmation of the 2005 joint statement and the commitments they made there. So in that sense, I think that still is the standing document for future negotiations. And and so I think that was an important agreement. Another negative verdict, much more stern, about Bush's approach to North Korea comes from David Sanger, the chief Washington correspondent of the New York Times, whom we interviewed last spring. He argues that Bush took a messy, dangerous problem and made it worse. Where, in your opinion, do these unapologetic negative evaluations stem from? David's a friend, and uh, I've participated him with a number, in a number of events, and he's covered the issue very carefully. I think the negative assessments in part flow from a heroic assumption that if the United States simply just sat down with North Korea and negotiated with them, then all of our problems would be solved. So it's based on this assumption that the United States has within its capacity to simply solve this problem if it were just to sit down with the North Koreans and talk about it. But again, if you look at the history of negotiations for the past quarter century, the United States has sat down with North Korea. At one point during the Clinton administration, we invited North Korean officials into the White House. So there have been real efforts. Every, every U.S. president has sent a personal communication to the leadership of North Korea, including President Bush. So there have been real efforts to do this. My own view is I don't think the problem is U.S. policy. I think the problem is you have a country, you know, north of the 38th parallel, that is dead set on becoming a nuclear weapon state. And at times they have rented a freeze of their programs, you know, to get food and fuel and other things. But in the end, the national ambition has been, as defined by the leadership, has been to become a nuclear weapon state. And so if that's the goal of a sovereign country, and countries outside of that sovereign country aren't going to use force, you know, they're not going to attack the country or preemptively strike them to stop them from doing this, then it becomes very difficult to stop programs like that. And simply just talking to them, trying to negotiate with them, is not going to be the answer to the problem. Would you say there's a certain naivete in this critical assessment? Or maybe is it a lack of knowledge about what happens behind the curtain? Or maybe, as Professor Sung Yun Lee, whom we interviewed a while back, there's a certain condescendence and paternalism towards North Korea? I don't know. I mean, again, I think there is this sort of heroic assumption that the only real obstacle to ending North Korea's nuclear program is having the United States sit down earnestly and negotiate with the North Koreans. And I think we have. You know, I think whether it was during Bush or during Obama or during Clinton, I think the United States has done that, has taken the effort to sit down and really try to negotiate. And I've been a part of those negotiations. And I can tell you that um, the United States tried very hard to try to offer North Korea a package of things to get them to freeze and then ultimately dismantle their programs. Again, the problem is if you have a negotiation counterpart that in the end is interested in having a nuclear weapons arsenal, it's very difficult for those negotiations to succeed. And therefore, I think observers should be careful just because the result is unsuccessful to simply then make the logical leap and say it's because of the United States that it's been unsuccessful. It could very well be because it's the North Koreans that really don't want to give up their programs. So the outcomes you're speaking about were, hence, inevitable. Even if Al Gore had won in 2000 or John Kerry in 2004 for the presidential elections, the U.S. would have still been stuck with an interlocutor that doesn't want to communicate. I mean, hypotheticals are always difficult to answer, but my own view is I think that's the case. I think that 
a national decision was made quite some time ago for North Korea to be a nuclear weapon state and that regardless of who was in power or what the purpose of the negotiations were, there was always going to be an element of that, you know, an element of clandestine programs, an element of foot dragging on the part of the North Koreans that was always that was always going to be there. Why do I think that that was the view of the North Koreans? Because I think North Koreans learn from history. They watched China explode a nuclear device in 1964 and eventually become a member of the UN National Security Council and Taiwan get kicked out. After um, 35 years of occupation, they basically saw the Japanese occupation of Korea end with the dropping of two nuclear bombs. So I think they learned from this history, and they believe that this is really, I mean, incorrectly, I think, they believe that this is the solution to their problems. Uh, and so for that reason, it might, might not have mattered who was in office in Washington. From early on, Bush spoke of the axis of evil with Iraq, Iran, and North Korea as its most prominent members. Iraq was invaded, attacking Iran was, at times, apparently an option. Were similar considerations ever made in the White House for North Korea? Not while I was there. I mean, President Bush has always said he, that he seeks a peaceful, negotiated solution to the problem. Um, so at least in my understanding, President Bush was never interested in invading North Korea, again, contrary to what some of the pundits and journalists and others said. He'd always been of the view that the answer to this problem was a negotiated diplomatic solution. And that's why he helped to create the Six Party Talks. Looking back a decade later, would you do things differently? Is there anything you would possibly try to push for, uh, have other policies, more engagement, emphasize other perspectives? Uh, you know, that's, that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, of course, it would have been great to have better coordination with the South Korean government. I mean, at the time, our counterpart was the No Myeon government in South Korea, a fairly progressive government. President Bush was a fairly conservative administration. Um, and sometimes that made it hard to coordinate policy, so I wish that would have been better. The external variable in all of this was, of course, 9-11. 9-11 shaped very much the Bush presidency and had a natural impact on very real concerns that there would be another terrorist attack on the homeland of the United States and the very real concern that that terrorist attack next time could not simply be airliners being flown into buildings, but somebody having a dirty bomb or fissile material, or even a nuclear device that they might explode in a major U.S. city. And so those sorts of things always colored everything that had to do with any negotiation with a country like North Korea outside of the NPT regime that potentially could sell weapons to non-state terrorist actors. And so obviously one wishes that that was not the context in which the negotiations took place. But one of the things that you learn very quickly in policy is you can wish that things aren't the way they are, but you really have no choice. And so you, you know, you know, what you try to do is you're given all these lemons and how do you make lemonade out of those lemons? When we talk about North Korea and how to deal with it, we usually focus on the nuclear program. But as you emphasize in your 2012 book, The Impossible State, the human rights situation there warrants way more attention. You sum the issue up in one chapter heading the worst place on earth. Is it? And why? Uh, yeah, I think it's very difficult to make an argument that it is not the worst place on earth because of the human rights violations, because in general, the government has mismanaged the economy in ways in which they have never made rational economic decisions. They've all been politically, ideologically based. And the primary victims of that um, have been the North Korean people. So in that sense, there are many places that are bad on this earth, but this has got to be one of the worst, particularly when you get outside of, uh, outside of Pyongyang. Other authoritarian regimes seem to legitimize their rule by improving the life of their citizens, with China being the most obvious example. Why does the North Korean regime not take this route and seemingly not care about the fate of their own population? Because I think the core difference between cases like China or even Burma or others in North Korea is that The main difference in North Korea is that the country is based on this sort of myth, this personality myth, that the rationale for the state is the maintenance of this cult of personality uh, for the Kim family. And so in that sense, you know, in China, we've had this in the past, but we certainly don't have it today. And so you can have 
non-open or closed political leadership systems, but closed political leadership systems that can still make fairly rational economic decisions. And the difference in the case of North Korea is because it is all about the family and it is all about the personality cult and the maintenance of that personality cult, you can't make rational economic decisions. You can't sort of think about what we should do that's best uh, for our people. The main thing is to try to maintain this family system and to maintain particularly the legitimacy and credibility of this new young leader. And so the people suffer as a result of that because you get a regime that's very insecure and unwilling to do things that would open up the society to external forces, which would then, of course, draw questions and about the legitimacy of the leadership in the regime. But why did these humanitarian issues not experience more focus in the public, especially compared to the nuclear issue? It's a good question. I think part of it is because North Korea is this far away and unknown place that the general public doesn't care about or think about. Part of it is U.S. policy in the sense that U.S. policy has always been focused primarily on the nuclear issue uh, and not on things like human rights. And part of it is because in South Korea, too, I think the primary focus has been on inter-Korean talks and maybe the nuclear issue, but not so much the human rights issue. And so if the general public doesn't really care about it, if the U.S. policy doesn't really care about it, if the South Koreans don't really care about it, then it's not going to be one of the major policy issues. I think fortunately over the last year and a half or so, that has changed dramatically You know, with the COI, the UN Commission of Inquiry Report, the North Korean Freedom Act in the U.S. Congress that has created actually a change in the way that we view uh, the human rights issue and a change for the better in the sense that now you have senior U.S. officials in every statement that they make on North Korea, they not only talk about the nuclear program, they also talk about the human rights program. That to me is a sign that the United States has decided that this problem, the human rights problem that is, is just as important as the nuclear problem and that if we were ever to get back into a negotiation, it wouldn't just be about the nuclear issues, it would also be about the human rights problems. But while the world knows about the humanitarian crisis, at the same time, it is commonly not only seen as a tragedy, but also as a joke. There's apparently quite some demand for media stories about Kim Jong-un's obesity, his latest fad, or the newest palace gossip. Can you laugh at it, knowing what happens? No, I, I think that's a fair question, and I think there is a good deal of truth to that. Um, the North Korea problem in the media, the, the actually threat, whether you're talking about the security threat or the threat to human dignity, is quite real. But because the country is so closed and because the leadership appears so quirky, it becomes a very interesting sort of media story, whether it's Dennis Rodman going to North Korea or whether it's Kim Jong-un's wife or it's the new ski resort or, you know, whatever it is, it becomes something that's um, of great interest to the media. Um, I actually had a conversation with some people on a prominent U.S. media network about this. And part of the reason they say they cover North Korea and these sorts of things so often is because there's actually a great deal of interest in it, that when there's a North Korea story, they find that their viewer ratings go up, like they go up, they spike quite high. And I think part of that is because on almost any other issue in the media, you know, whether it's the Iran deal or whether it's uh, race riots in Baltimore or whatever the issue is, when people watch the news and they see that story come up, they already have sort of preformed opinions. So they may be watching it, but they already tune it out because they already know what they think about it. But North Korea is such a black box that when people see a story about it on TV, they really have no preconceptions about it. So they're locked in and they watch it and they're fascinated by it. Um, but what they're really fascinated by is the mystery and all the sort of quirky and weird things about North Korea. And so the media plays to that, I think, um, rather than focusing on the nuclear story. Also, on the nuclear story, it's pretty much been said already. You know, they know what the story is, which is a country that is defying everybody and building nuclear weapons. That's the end of the story. There's not much else that they can say. Um, so I think for all these reasons, the media tends to focus on these sort of bizarre things about North Korea, but at the same time, real issues, the, the nuclear uh, threat and the human rights threats, tend to get downplayed. In this context, 
You mention in your book that President Bush stood out among politicians through his attention to these human rights issues. Where did this interest come from and did it have a consequence any actual diplomacy or policy making? I think for President Bush, where it came from was it was something that came very personally from his heart. He had something called the Human Freedom Initiative. He currently has it at the Bush Institute in Dallas, um, where he's always, you know, we heard him say it many times, he's always believed that for every human being deep down in his or her heart, there's only one thing that they really desire, and that's freedom. And so he's particularly drawn to these countries where freedom was suppressed and brought in dissidents from uh, other countries where the leadership suppressed them, brought the first ever North Korean defectors into the White House, into the Oval Office. So I think it, came, it was a very personal thing for him. I think that's where it came from. But we also saw it in terms of policy. Again, Congress passed the North Korean Freedom Act during the Bush administration. For the first time, the United States appointed a special envoy for North Korean human rights abuses. That continues to this day. Uh, for the first time, the United States was the first country outside South Korea to set up a refugee resettlement program for North Korean defectors. Uh, again, first to bring defectors into the Oval Office. I think all of these things were firsts that happened during the Bush presidency and that stemmed from, I think, sort of this very personal belief that the president had about why individuals, human beings, should, should have freedom. That's where it, it all came from. And even though these things um, are associated with President Bush, I mean, the human rights issue in Washington, D.C., the North Korean human rights issue in Washington, D.C., is not a partisan issue. In fact, this is one of the few issues on which, you know, when you go to talk to people on the Hill or you talk to others about this, uh, there's no disagreement. Uh, everybody believes more attention should be paid to this issue. Yet, at the same time, it is hard to ignore the fact that the Bush presidency contributed greatly to what former President Jimmy Carter called America's loss of moral authority on the matter of human rights. How are the two possible? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and I can understand where it comes from, given concerns about enhanced interrogation techniques and other sorts of things that happened as a part of the war against terror. But one of the hats that I wear is at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., and we do a study or a poll every three or four years of strategic elites in countries in Asia. And um, one of the questions is a question on the extent to which you value human freedom, democracy, democratic values as being a compass for foreign policy. So we did one survey that took place during the Bush administration, one survey that took place during the Obama administration. If you look at the survey on this question, in Asia, basically the responses across the two time periods were pretty much consistent. You know, in Singapore, for example, it was low. In Japan, it was fairly high. The one place where there was a dramatic change was actually in the United States. In the previous period, a fairly large number, if not a majority, of uh, Americans believe that human freedom, human dignity, democratic values should be an important compass for U.S. foreign policy. And that really dropped off in the current administration. So I don't know. I mean, I think that there's been a lot of attention to sort of things that happened as a part of the war against terror. But I don't think that those sorts of things necessarily apply to U.S. policy towards Asia. And in that case, I think the record in terms of being supportive of human rights and uh, human freedom is pretty strong. So you just mentioned the attitude towards human rights at a societal level. But what about at the level of the president himself? Has President Barack Obama been as personally invested in human rights issues in North Korea as was President Bush? Well, President Obama reauthorized the North Korean Human Rights Act already once in his presidency. It'll come up again in the fall. So in that sense, I think he has he has a very good envoy in Robert King, a special envoy for North Korean human rights abuses. Kerry and Samantha Power and others have been very supportive of the work that the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council has done on North Korean human rights. So I think they've done a fine job. They've done a very suitable job. I think the real challenge for the future is We've developed an international consensus that this problem is bad and that the United Nations is strongly singling out North Korea as a human rights abuser. I think the challenge for the next administration is what's the next step? You know, how do you implement the recommendations of the Commission of Inquiry? 
you know, does that mean trying to bring the North Korean leadership before the ICC? Or I think for U.S. policy more broadly, does it means how do you integrate a human rights policy with a denuclearization policy? Because historically, those two things have been very separate. And I think it's harder and harder now to separate those two things. That actually leads us to our next question. What would you do? What do you believe should be the next step? What can the rest of the world do to actually help and improve the North Korean situation? Well, I think, you know, there's already a, a infrastructure for this in the UN system, right? The UN Human Rights Council, the uh, resolutions that get passed every year. There are a couple of things. One, I think the UN Security Council should certainly take advantage of the resolution that was passed last year to make the North Korea issue an agenda item for discussion on the UN Security Council. Um, that is something that might be opposed by some members, like China, for example, and Russia, and maybe some others, given the current composition of the UN Security Council. But there still are informal ways to continue to do that, and that's important. I mean, the transition and the change that took place in Burma's relations with the world, what preceded that, that many people don't know, was that the UN Security Council did have a resolution at one point to allow for discussion of the Burma issue. And so the same thing should happen uh, uh, with North Korea. The other, the other thing, at least from U.S. policy, is you know, to the extent that we can help to get more information into North Korea, that's very important. There is clearly an insatiable thirst and hunger for information about the outside from North Korean society as it becomes more aware of what's taking place outside of the country. So that's a second. And the third is that uh, the United States has a modest defector resettlement program, about 170 or so North Korean defectors now living in the United States. The more that we can do to help those people be successful it would be important to demonstrate to the North Korean people that you can have success outside of uh, the country and also help, directly help North Korean people. You know, again, it's harder to do that with people inside the country because of the controls that are placed on them. But one could certainly help the people who have escaped. Arguably, the most important event in North Korea after Bush left office was the death of Kim Jong-il after 17 years in power. You wrote that this event accelerated the crisis of governance that that North Korea was suffering from and forced an abbreviated and rushed dynastic succession process to the inexperienced and not yet 30-year-old son, Kim Jong-un. Three years later, is there still a crisis of governance in North Korea and how has the young leader fared so far? Now, of course, we're all guessing when it comes to this because nobody has a really good sense of what is taking place inside of North Korea. But I would argue that there still is a crisis of governance. There are always purges and executions that take place in a leadership transition in closed societies like North Korea. But the news that we get of defense ministers and others being executed within the past year, a good three to four years into the transition, doesn't give one a sense that the transition is going smoothly or as, as expected. To put it very simply, if, you're, if you continue to knock off people that you have brought into leadership positions, who are supposed to be your people, three or four years into a leadership transition, your leadership transition is not going well. I don't know what the numbers are. What people have said, 90 high level or even more executions that have taken place. You know, it's not like we have reliable numbers on, on this sort of stuff. But that to me is not a good sign. And the fact that Normally, normally, I mean, that's always a relative term when it comes to North Korea, but normally when these sorts of things take place and you have these scores of executions, they tend to be of the people who used to be in power with the previous leadership. You don't see them executing their own people, right? Their own sort of coterie of people that they're bringing in. So that's not a good sign, I think. Plus, there are lots of concerns about his health, right? Um, we don't know very much about, you know, why he disappeared. And again, the fact that he's so young and really doesn't have much experience in this position, I think, concerns a lot of people that the North Korean system may be less stable. I'm certainly of the view that, you know, I think that this is not a system that can last forever. And I know there are many other people who have argued to the opposite. Uh, there are many other people who've taken some of the things that I've written and said, look at how wrong he was about the problems in North Korea and how it was all going to come down. 
But, you know, I mean, the North Korean system will look stable up until the day that it collapses. And people tend to forget that. You know, there are many political scientists and pundits and others who predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union after it happened, right? And there are many who predicted the Arab Spring after it happened. I am not one of those people. I'm willing to say, in my own opinion, I look at what's happening there. I look at sort of the elements of polity and the economic situation, the social structure, and I just say that I don't think that this can last. And so I'm not going to be one of those people the day after North Korea collapses saying, oh, it was obvious it should have collapsed, because I do think that there are problems that are not easily solvable and that lead to a dead end for the regime. In your book, you mentioned that along with that transition was an ideology that you called the neo juche revitalism. So what's the difference very briefly between Juche and neo juche And three years later, is this still the official party line? Yeah, I, I think that the idea of neo juche revivalism was this notion that many people thought with Kim Jong-un that we would get a more enlightened leader because of his education outside of North Korea and Europe and that he would be more attuned to the West and would be willing to open up North Korea. And contrary to that, I think what we found is that not only are they adopting wholesale the policies and ideologies of his grandfather, but they're adopting them in a fashion that is even more hardline than his father which was uh, sort of military first politics and things. So it's even more hardline than that. And so it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction, you know, and physically they make him look like his grandfather, all this sort of stuff. It seemed as though the North Koreans with the sudden death of Kim Jong-il were searching for a narrative for their new leadership. And, you know, because they aren't very open to the outside world, they're not really very well versed in what other models of charismatic leadership should be. So they went back to what they found sort of the best times for them, which were the 1950s and the 1960s under Kim Il-sung. And that's what we're seeing today is basically a revivalism of Chuche ideology. And I think if you talk to people who live in North Korea, the diplomatic community, they all feel it. They all feel that the state is closing in. They're much less open than they were in the past, um, and that there's definitely something going on there. And, and I think it's worrying to most. So beyond the Kim family, do you believe that endogenous change uh, to be still a possibility? Uh, for example, could there be some kind of revolution upwards from the masses, like during the Arab Spring, or maybe a change in the domestic power balance? Um, it's very hard to answer that question. Um, I don't think a people's revolution is likely just because the people are so downtrodden. I do believe that there are elements of the leadership that are unhappy, that are not satisfied with the rule of this young leader. How that manifests itself, that dissatisfaction, you know, whether it's a coup or whether it's an assassination attempt, we just don't know. We just don't know how it will be reflected. I do think one of the most interesting things about North Korea has been the way that society has reacted every time the North Korean leadership has somehow tried to clamp down on the market elements of society, whether it was re-denominating the currency or trying to close down the black markets. That is often when we have heard anecdotal evidence of social resistance. And so to me, you know, again, we're just guessing, but I think one of the triggers in the future could be another attempt by the government to somehow uh, shut down or close down elements of a market economy, you know, whether it's cell phones, whether it's the black markets, whether it's the official markets, whether it's, again, trying to re-denominate the currency and wipe out everybody's savings. These are the sorts of things that are going to cause widespread resistance. When the collapse of North Korea come or the unification or when something big happens, are there plans in the White House drawer for how to deal with this new political, economical, social situation and the new challenges it will cause? So it's been a long time since I worked at the White House, so I don't know what they're doing today. I would like to believe that everybody has a good plan for this. But having worked in government, my experience is that governments, because they're so busy dealing with what's happening today, don't have a lot of time to think about hypotheticals that may happen in the future and that may not happen in the future. They just don't have enough time and resources to do that. 
Uh, so for that reason, I'm always worried that if North Korea were to collapse tomorrow, that countries around the region, including the United States, aren't ready. Uh, even South Korea is not ready for the magnitude of what one would have to deal with. Having said that, I think this is not the only time or would not be the only time in history that South Korea and the United States have faced surprises that looked very difficult to manage. Uh, but each time, you know, whether it was the Korean War, whether it was democratization, whether it was economic growth, you know, each time they've always managed to find a way to cope. And I think that would be the case with the unification as well. So in conclusion, Dr. Cha, uh, maybe a more personal question. If North Korea was to collapse tomorrow, the phone rings and the president asks you for your service in the White House. Would you be up for it once again? Or was that maybe a once-in-lifetime marathon, to borrow the term you used in your own book? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I think for any of us who study Korea, the uni unification of the Korean Peninsula, first of all, is the natural course of history. I think all of us believe that. And even though this period from 1945 to whatever, 2015 or longer, was a period of incredible economic success in South Korea, political transformation, uh, Korea um, playing on the global stage, all of those wonderful things, it'll still be remembered as an aberration in history because it was a period when the Korean Peninsula was divided. So I think that's the natural course of things, that's a natural history of things. I think any of us, any of us sitting here, any of us listening to this who care about Korea would want to be a part of an effort to try to help Korean unification. Dr. Cha, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.